good morning, church. Man, it's good to see you on this windy, brisk Sunday. A little bit colder. I should have worn sleeves. I'm just saying, all right? Uh, but it is so good to see you. I missed you guys last week. I was at our Anderson campus. Um, it was my first time uh, being there um, at, in their new building. Before, um, it was when they were in the hotel space. And I don't know why, but I was always scheduled like on the week of spring break for college students or like Thanksgiving. So there was like 20 to 30 college students. And I always, like Will, our campus pastor there, was like, man, what God's doing is crazy. And I'm like, dude, this is kind of like, you know, the guy who says he has a girlfriend, but you've never met her type thing. And so to go and to see a room packed um, of families and college students was amazing. And I officially felt really old to see all those college students um, in that. And so, but it was so cool. And, And I always say this. And I probably don't say it enough, but if you've never checked out one of our campuses, man, what God is doing across all campuses at our church is just amazing. It really is. I know you might call this place home, and I hope that you do. And, but you, you miss out in some ways, obviously we share it, but what God is doing um, at other campuses is just um, incredible to see what he's doing at Anderson, um, I know Harrison Bridge, um, not too long ago, got a new worship space. They just uh, used their old worship space, renovated it for a new kid space. So that's amazing. Haywood has been uh, renovated in their worship center. They just finished their kid space. Um, and it's just amazing that uh, we're, we are not, believe it or not, we are not the only campus that is dealing with and managing the tension of capacity um, issues. Uh, our 10 o'clock and our 1120 here are packed, um, as are kids' spaces, um, and um, that's a great problem to have. Um, I know it's a tension to be managed, but at the same time, it's one of those things I would rather have too many kids than not any kids um, in our space. And so for us to continue to do that just presents some, some uh, different challenges. And, and I would say, I was thinking about this, um, some of you that were here from the very beginning, you remember this, um, but um, many of you don't know the story uh, of our campus. Um, it's hard to believe that at the end of March, we will celebrate five years from the time that we launched. And I want to show you a picture of what this place looked like when it was just studs and gravel. So this was January 6, 2019. So um, what you're looking at is kind of um, the space where those double windows in the middle are actually just behind these doors in our lobby. And to the left of the picture is uh, the start of our worship space. And so on January 6, We gathered here, and this is the very first time our church ever did anything like this. It's hard to believe that in 2019, we had obviously our our downtown Simpsonville campus. We had just kind of relaunched, if you will, our Harrison Bridge campus, um, even though it had been a part um, or a campus uh, for roughly around 10 years at that point called the West Campus at the time. But um, man, this is the first time our church ever embarked on something like this. So we... um, started to lease this space. We built it out. It's become home. We existed for about nine months and then COVID hit. And um, and so just kind of put a damper on some things. Uh, I'll be honest, kind of killed some momentum. I'll never forget when the first Sunday after COVID we met and we went from about, I don't know, 180 or so people. And then we had 45 on that first Sunday and we spread them out, all those, you know, whatever, and then it was 15 people each service. I'm like, this is depressing, all right? And then on top of that, I was so excited because I, I didn't like staying at home. And I remember preaching my, my, my heart out, and I get down, and our youngest son was like, I'm, he told me, I'm glad that's over. You talked forever. I'm like, thanks, pastor's kids, you know, pastor's kid. But I say all that because we embarked on something as um, a church that we said, hey, there's a vision that we want to reach the upstate and Five Forks is where God is calling us. And so on that day, we gathered, we worshiped, we prayed on the studs of this room. uh, There are scriptures, there are prayers, there's all kinds of things that um, God really used. And I'm so thankful. If you were there that day, you were part um, of an amazing work, being super faithful in, in what 
God is um, doing in that. So um, with that, here we are five years later with three services um, at capacity. We average about 40 middle school and high school students on a Sunday morning. Um, We usually have 100, if not more, kids on a Sunday morning. Um, Every Sunday of January, we've increased in our number of attendants. Usually, I would say, averaging about 450. Um, This is our lightest service. Um, and what it's all God and what God is doing, um, is amazing. And I would say this, especially if you're a kids volunteer, I would say this, it would be super easy for every single one of us to get frustrated and upset to say, Hey, we're running out of space. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with some of you that said, Hey, what's going on here? Um, or what's next? And then it could be very easily to be upset to say, well, other campuses are doing this or they're building this. When's our turn? That kind of thing. And here's the beauty of one church is that we're working in all of this together. And as a staff team, we have been um, really diligent to kind of walk through all kind of opportunities to see what's next. We started with saying, hey, let's, build, let's buy this entire building. We talked to the doctor's office. It was in the height of the real estate market. It just didn't make sense. Um, and, and so we, we talked about that. We looked at all kind of different land options and different things, and it's just God was just closing doors. So I just say all that to say, one, man, I'm so thankful for your patience and your faithfulness and sacrifice and steadiness to say, hey, this is um, what's going on. And so you probably have seen this on Facebook, and you're probably like, get on with it, bro. But um, and so as a staff team, once again, I would say we're trendsetters because uh, we started leasing this space. We've never done this before, but we are in serious conversations and we are pursuing the purchase of land. And so I wanted to show you where that land is. So if you can show on um, that next screen, here's Google map. You can see us at the very bottom, right off of Woodruff Road. If you were to cross Woodruff Road coming out of here less than a mile up on the corner of Roper Mountain and Batesville Road, we have signed a letter of intent. Now, I'm, I'm like a dummy when it comes to all this commercial real estate stuff. But here's um, the beauty of this is that we have to do like due diligence. So we've had engineers out there to do all this other stuff. And we've had to make drawings and different things on this property. It's 11 acres plus or minus a little bit. Um, And here's the beauty. Because of your faithfulness and because of the faithfulness of every member of First Baptist Simpsonville Upstate Church, we are able to purchase this land outright. We're not doing a capital campaign you can clap on that. Okay, I'm just saying. Praise God. <laughs> all right. So I, I'm not standing up here to be like, all right, everybody got checkbooks. <laughs> all right. Um, man, God has been faithful in this, and we are embarking on something huge. Let me zoom in and kind of give you a closer look at this property. So um, hopefully you're familiar with this. If you go up, um, this this is the property, um, um, and I, it's a great location. But here's why I bring this before you, because one, it's great to celebrate, um, but um, here's the thing I need you to pray. I need you to pray this big time for two things. One, so at the end of February, I think it's like the 23rd, they will begin to put signs on the property for uh, a rezoning. It has to be rezoned for a church. And on March 13th, you can write that whatever, in your notes or however you need to remember, on March 13th will be our hearing before Greenville County. And it will be to the discretion of the county members if they approve the rezoning. Once that is done um, and they say, hey, a church can be built there, um, then we can purchase officially the land. So we've done our due diligence. We have spent money, as I mentioned, on the survey and all these different things. But let me just be um, quite frank with you um, in this, is that this is, yes, the land is one thing, and praise God for your faithfulness and the faithfulness of so many across all campuses. Um, The land is the easy part. The building is not so easy. Super expensive. And so I say that because we are embarking and taking a huge step of faith 
as a church, knowing that God will provide, that you will be and continue to be good stewards of your resources. Um, but this is exciting. This is so awesome. And um, like I said, we've never done this before. So I'm sure um, we're, we're trendsetters, all right? So we're going we're gonna to lead the way in this. Pray for favor uh, with the county um, people. And, um, and this will require sacrifice. It will require um, finances. I don't have a timeline, obviously. Um, we will need to, we don't have the money to, right now to build a huge building. And who knows what God has in store. During this time, we could purchase the land. And, you know, with other campuses, we've merged uh, with churches. Or he might provide another opportunity in the process of this. Man, we just want to be good stewards. And we want to do whatever God says. And so, um, and I hope it's building a building on this piece of property because it's awesome. <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> This is this being selfish, all right? So uh, March 13th, pray for that. Um, I'll give you more details as they come along. But isn't that exciting? I feel like I'm going to share it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to share that because I know for many of you, um, it's like, okay, what's going on? Like, are we just going to stay in here forever? Every campus is getting stuff. And uh, man, they have sacrificed and uh, done things as well. We're one church, so we're unified in this. And um, it's going to be a beautiful, beautiful day. So, hey, let me pray. And then we're going to dig into Revelation 4 and 5 this morning. God, thank you so much for being an incredible God that we can come. And you have been so faithful. And, and reaching this community. We want to be an incredible neighbor. And not just one that just puts up some big building and tears down trees, but a, a green space that is inviting, that can be used for our community in a whole slew of ways. And God, but most importantly, that people see you, that we as a church, as a campus, would be a city on a hill. And so, Father, go before us as you have in every step of the way. Don't let our impatience or our selfishness get in the way, but let your plan prevail and win every single time. And we trust you no matter what. But we specifically pray for March 13th, that God, that with your favor and the favor of the county, that it would be rezoned and we can begin moving forward in the purchase of this land and eventually a building to say, God, you are good. To continue to see lives radically changed for you. And so God, you are faithful. And as we dig into your word, let us continually and see and remember that you are king. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Awesome. Well, that's exciting. Don't share that on Facebook and ruin it um, for the next two services, okay? Uh, just tell them something crazy. Just tell them something stupid like, oh, they got more kids. That's what that's announced, okay? So I don't know. Don't tell them that. My wife will kill you. So, um, but anyway, hey, turn with me to Revelation 4 and 5. That's where we're going to be this morning. Uh, we're in our fourth week. Uh, we're like, a, I guess, a third of the way, quarter of the way through this thing. And um, now we kind of hit on a different scene. Uh, we looked at kind of introductory notes the first week. The last two weeks, we were in the letters to the church. And now we shift gears to chapters 4 and 5 that give us a glimpse of heaven. And, and, I, and I just feel, I don't do this all the time. You know this because I'm not a great reader. I don't have um, great reading comprehension, plus I have ADD. But I felt like this morning, because it's such a beautiful passage, that it was important for us to read all of chapter 4 and 5. And to let God's word speak and for us to imagine what John is envisioning in this moment so that we can really understand and grasp what is going on in this. And then I'll break it up a little bit and we'll talk through some of these things. But um, we see this shift. The letters are done um, at the church of Laodicea. Jesus uh, told John to write these things. They were apathetic. They were lukewarm. And he said... He kind of ended, he said, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So chapter 4, we now see this beautiful picture. It'll be on the screens. Let me read 4, and then I'll stop and pause, and we'll uh, come up for air for just a little bit, all right? Chapter 4, follow along the screens with me. It says, after this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet saying, come up here and I will show you what must take place 
after this. And at once I was in the spirit and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and uh, Carnelian, I think that's how you say it. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. And around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the, on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was at it were a, sea of, uh, were a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion. The second living creature like an ox. The third living creature with the face of a man. And the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night, they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders, they fall down before him who is seated on the throne and they worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. All right, let's pause for just a second. So you have this beautiful, somewhat weird, okay, picture of heaven. Now, John, it, by the spirit of the Lord, God brings him up to see what is taking place in heaven. And so he begins to describe uh, this scene. And what we see is actually God sitting on a throne. And here he is wearing a crown, right? And um, around him are other thrones of 24 elders. And you might be thinking, all right, who are the 24 elders? Elders. Now, if you remember the first week, uh, we're not going to elevate what we speculate. It's one of the things I said. And there's a lot of different opinions about the 24 elders. I would probably say the most prominent opinion is that the 24 elders actually represent 12 patriarchs of the Old Testament. So people like Moses and Abraham and Isaac, Isaiah, those types of patriarchs. And that the other 12 are the disciples. Now, let me kind of poke a hole in that. If, it, if that was true, just my opinion. John would be seated on one of those, but yet he's not. He's in the vision. And so then um, in the early church, many people thought the 24 elders were just 24 saints and kind of a variety of people um, in the Old Testament and the New Testament. But really, if you really study this, it really is just a symbol for the church. It's a symbol, you can actually go back to 1 Chronicles and um, talk about how you see how God divides the church. There's like musicians and priests and, and they're all divided by 24. So it might just be a symbolic number. We can't speculate. Um, here's what I do know. I've never met a person that said, I really want to believe in Jesus. But before I do, who are the 24 elders? <laughs> okay. And so we can speculate and have our opinion but what I do know is that they're sitting on thrones and they have a crown on their head. Now, let me kind of throw another note at this. The word um, that's used for the crown that they are wearing is Stephanos in the Greek. And that's more of like a flower crown. because It's not the same as what we see when we talk about Jesus wearing a crown. That's a diadem. That's a crown of royalty. So the crowns that the 24 elders are um, encompassed around God are inferior to the diadem crown. You following me? All right. And so you have that. Then you have these crazy looking animals that are there and they're worshiping nonstop, um, saying, um, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God 
Almighty. And it's just this incredible picture with a rainbow that looks like emerald, which I don't know how that translates. But then you have before the throne of God a, a sea. Now, it's not a literal sea. It's kind of uh, figurative in the way of like kind of what we would say like the ocean or the sea of humanity type. And the reason he talks about it as crystal is that before God in heaven, everything is calm. He's in control. He's a God of order. And so John envisions this, and um, it's an amazing, amazing picture. Let's continue chapter 5. It says, Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on back, sealed with seven seals. We'll get to that next week. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals. And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. So here's John. He says, I begin to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Verse 6, and between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb, Jesus, standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and he took the scroll from the right hand of God who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, for you were slain. By your blood, you ransomed the people for God, for every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. John said, then I looked and I heard among the throne or around the throne um, and the, the living creatures and the elders The voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor, and glory, and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, amen. And the elders fell down and worship. Man, I don't know if that doesn't get you excited. Your wood must be wet, bro. Because, man, like the incredible picture of now you have what John sees, one of the elders sees that God has a scroll in his hand. They're like, no one is worthy to touch it, to grab it, to even see and look into it. And behold, here is the Lamb of God, Jesus, who is the only one that is worthy to grab the scroll. So if you're taking notes this morning, the first, there's only two points. The first one is that he alone is worthy. God alone is worthy. Now, I kind of think about it this way. Hopefully you've seen the movie, uh, The Wizard of Oz, right? Um, it's kind of creepy, right? If you think about it, I'm like, why is that my like, like a kid's favorite movie, you know? It's kind of like Will, Willy Wonka. That's weird too. But uh, in, the, in The Wizard of Oz, you know the story. Man, Dorothy and her friends are frantically looking to try to get back to Kansas, right? Or to get things. And so they have to follow the yellow brick road and they have to go to The Wizard of Oz. And they're all excited with great anticipation to once they get to Emerald City and they see The Wizard of Oz and they pull the curtain back, he's a fraud. He's a little weak man with some megaphone that looks and, and acts fake. And every, he's got everybody fooled. 
But what I love is that what we see in Revelation 4 and 5 is the exact opposite of that. That we come and John comes right before the throne of God. And it isn't a fraud. It isn't a fake. It isn't make-believe. It isn't like, oh, that's not who we thought. It is the one who is worthy of it all. And these verses indicate, as I mentioned, that even John depicts that there's an extensive search to say who is worthy to open the scroll. The search party had no results. And then this elder comes and speaks because John is in despair. He looks and he says, you know what? This ain't going to happen. No one is worthy. And he's sad. And he's in despair, in distress. And it made me think about this just to kind of apply this to our lives. Many things in our relationships and in our life take precedent over God. And to be honest, we are our own search party, looking and evaluating the things in our life that hopefully we would like to think would make us happy. Maybe it's our job. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's good grades to get into that college. Maybe it's our kid's success that I didn't have it like this, so I hope that they have it. And we begin, excuse me, to look at all these different ways, searching for something that is worthy and has purpose in our life. And what we're ended up being met with is just like John, the same emotion of despair, disappointment, and things. And we place those things, whether it's intentional or not, on a throne. We place, place those things to be kings of our lives, and they dictate our behaviors, our actions, our lives, our thoughts, our calendars. And there's only one that needs to be on that throne, and that's Jesus, because he's worthy of it all. He is worthy by himself. Now, if you're taking notes, I would write this down. Jesus is not one of many. Jesus is the one and only. He's not one of many ways to lead to satisfaction, to lead to hope, to lead to purpose, to make you happy, to fill up your needs, to get your uh, wishes granted. Man, he alone is worthy. We search for what we think can satisfy and try to bring us joy when the only one that needs to be in that spot is Jesus. I cannot tell you how many times, just being completely transparent, where marriages are in distress, finances are a wreck, Your kids aren't being discipled the way they should be. Fill in the blank. And I counsel people and I say, how's your relationship with God? And the answer is usually it's non-existent. So for us, Jesus has to be at the center of all things. Why is he worthy of it all? John says that, well, what they proclaim in heaven, that he, Jesus, conquered He has conquered. He has conquered sin and death. And he did it in such a way, not by overpowering and killing all of his enemies. That day will come, and we'll see that in a few weeks. But mainly by conquering sin and death so that you and I can have life and have it forever to be with him. So in a search for what will satisfy us, Jesus is our only hope. We see that he's the only one That is worthy. Here's the second note um, and point this morning. That not only is he alone worthy, he alone is able. Now, if we're honest, how many times we put God in a box? We put him up on a little shelf, kind of forget about him. But then every now and then, we take him off the shelf. We look at him. We're like, that's nice. We might open up the box. We might think about some things. We We might even set some new goals to say, you know what? I need to wipe off the dust off this box and I probably need to start living for them. But in a short amount of time, we close it back up, put it on the shelf. And out of that, man, it's not a relationship. And maybe there's doubt of who he really says he is. Maybe there's doubt of what is he really able to do. But once again, as we look and we navigate this world, we look to things that we say, these things are able to satisfy me. These things will make me Um, feel complete. 
They will, make, they will give me hope and a purpose. And those things will never, ever satisfy. And so what we see once again is this incredible lamb who was slain. That he steps up to the hand of God. Now, also, just on a side note, almost every time in Scripture, I don't know how many, but almost every time in Scripture, when we look at Jesus, it says he's sitting on the right hand of the Father or of God. And John, I love this, says, as I look between the the animals and the creatures, there was the lamb and he was standing. And he's conquered He is able to turn that despair, to turn that um, hopelessness, that emptiness, that lack of purpose into something because he is able. And you and I, to a fault, look for everything else saying those things are able to provide satisfaction. In 1 John, John says this, Um, He says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but it's from the world. I mean, Jesus is able. He is worthy of it all. I love this and. Verse 13, it says, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And in verse 14, the four living creatures said, amen. Let it be so or let it be. And the elders fell down and worshiped. So here's my invitation this morning is Jesus, if Jesus It's not at the center of your life. Something else is. If he's not sitting on the throne, if he's not the king of your life, something else is. And as a response to who God is, that he is worthy and he alone is able, the only proper response is for you and I to fall on our knees and to worship him. Now, I'm a big history nerd and you probably know this, but when one king conquered another king in the ancient world now if he wasn't dead that king who was conquered would come before the other king he would bow down on his knees and he would take his crown and out of surrender and humility he would place it at the feet of the king who conquered and it's a beautiful picture of what we see in heaven but it really is a beautiful picture of what our lives should be every single day. So have you casted your crown to the conquering king? Have you knelt before him and humbly said, I want you to be king of my life. Let today be that day. Let's pray together. Father, you are the king. And so often we put ourselves and other things on the throne But God, you are worthy of it all. And this beautiful picture of you sitting on the throne and your son Jesus, the slain lamb of God, who alone is worthy, who alone is able, demands us to kneel before and worship. So Father, I specifically pray for the person here this morning who has never given their life to you, that today would be that day. Out of great humility, surrender, come before you and say, I'm not a good king. You are God. And I want to make you king of my life. Forgive me of my sins and allow me to live for you. I surrender my life today. God, let that be the prayer this morning. For anyone who's ready to take that next step, Father, I pray that this morning that with great boldness that they would talk to me or Miss Kathy or Brandon or Jill to say, man, I want to live for Jesus. Let us worship you with our lives, casting our crowns at your feet so that you reign. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.